with the mission of making laws more accessible and the vision of creating a one-stop resource center for lawyers and all things legal in Bangladesh. We like to think of Think Legal as a for good initiative. Think Legal is a collaboration between contributors and editors where they both together collect, crowdsource, and curate legal information. Think Legal lecture series, which is the brainchild of our co-editor, Sake Mahbub, uh, is our initiative to add to the knowledge pool uh, by generating information from renowned experts in our jurisdiction. And with that, I take great honor in introducing our learned speaker today, the Honorable Mr. Justice Muhammad Iman Ali. Good afternoon, Salaam Alaikum. It's good to see all bright faces here. I'm sorry I had to drink coffee in front of you while you were all without it. I felt a bit guilty, but not too guilty because I needed to wake me up. Now, before I start, I have to warn you, I'm going to show you a very short film, very, very short. And uh, I hope you'll look at it very carefully because I'll ask you questions afterwards about it. Now, the supporting actor, if you don't know who it was, here's a clue. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Amitabh Bachchan couldn't make it. What do I want to ask you about this film? Now, I, I'm sure some of you probably don't yet have any children. Some of you do. But do they remind you of children? The things they do? the frolicking, the love and attention that they want. That's the idea behind this film. Laws. What are laws for? Who needs laws? Do we need any extra laws for children? They're all citizens of this country. And as citizens, they are as much bound by the law, as much beneficiaries of the law, 
as are the adults of this country. All the laws apply to them equally. So why do we need separate laws for children? Any ideas, can I ask you? Why do we need separate laws for children? If all the other laws that we have, penal code and all the other statutes that you can talk about, if they all apply to children, why do we need separate laws for children? Any ideas? Let's have some ideas. They are vulnerable, yes. They need extra care and attention. Any other reasons? They can't make their own minds and decisions. They are immature. They are not yet matured enough to make their own decisions. They do not appreciate the reaction of others to their actions. They do not appreciate the end result of what they do. Now the philosophy about laws relating to children goes back to the mid-19th century. Before that, in fact, we still have the same problem right here, but even in the West, they had the problem of children being treated like chattels. Children who are working in the mines and the factories of America, England, if you've read Dickens, then you know all about it. But children, nevertheless, are different. Their mental, emotional, and psychological development is incomplete. The scientists tell us that the development of the brain of a child does not complete until the age of 25. So effectively, we could say that children are still children up to the age of 25. So why do we say they're major or mature at the age of 18? Can they not be mature before the age of 18? The answer to that is very simple. Yes, they may be, get mature before the age of 18. And yes, they may not mature even up to the age of 25. It will all depend on each individual case. But 18 is taken as a mean figure across the globe, and it is accepted. Now, you, some of you, or I hope most of you will know that our Majority Act says that person is major or no longer a minor at the age of 18. Now, that has been in our books since, what, 18-something, 93? No, something like that, 1890 or 93. 1875, thank you. See, somebody who knows the law. I don't know the law. I'm not supposed to know the law. I depend on lawyers to tell me what the law is. Now, the law is blind. We all know that because we see a statue of a lady who's blindfolded with a, something in one hand and a pair of scales on the other. And it, it the, applies equally to everyone. But our Constitution tells us that the law can be discriminatory in certain aspects particularly for women and children and the backward communities. And by that, we mean really the Adibashis. Article 28.4 says, nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making special provision in favor of women or children or for the advancement of the backward section of citizens. So the law, the Constitution allows laws to be discriminatory for children. And so we had the 1974 Children Act. It's a long way back, but I can tell you that's pro probably one of the best pieces of legislation that we had in this country, particularly for children. That's no longer with us. We have in place the Children Act of 2013 for the estimated 75 million children of this country. Now, let's have some background to this law. It all started in the year 2006, when we were dealing with a case of State versus Roshan Mondal. It's a very simple case. A boy of 15 raped and murdered an eight-year-old girl. 
I say simple because we could have disposed of that case in probably one page. We found that there was no legal evidence in this case. The only piece of evidence against this boy was the confessional statement taken by the police and nothing else. And we found that the confessional statement was defective in many ways, not the least of which was the fact that the girl's father himself admitted that the boy was beaten up by the police before the confessional statement was taken. So as you all know, the confessional statement is of no legal consequence as a result. But during that case, we realized that there was such a huge shortcoming in our knowledge of children's law. The Children's Act, which had been in place for since 1974, did I say? Yes, 74. Children's Rules, 1976. But yet, our judges and lawyers were not aware of the provisions of that law. So we decided to recommend that our law should first of all be either amended or um, new law created, enacted, in order to encompass or incorporate the provisions of the CRC. Now, I hope some of you will know what the CRC is. No? Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's, so to say, the Bible for children, because that encompasses all the relevant provisions regarding the rights of children. And it is applicable throughout the world. In fact, at last count, there were 195 countries of the world who have ratified this uh, convention. It is the most ratified convention of all time. Judgment was delivered on 9-7-2006, and lo and behold, seven years gestation, even more than the gestation period for our friend um, Junaid Chaudhry's book, which took, what did he say? Two years. So seven years, and we had the law in 2013. August 2013, and to this day, the law is hardly implemented. I am very sad to say. It talks about creation of National District Ubujela Child Welfare Boards. We won't dwell on that because that's um, to do with protection of children more than anything else. You will not be involved. Most of you are lawyers, I hope. I believe most, all of you probably are lawyers. So uh, that is not your part of the deal. Protection is to deal with neglected children, children who are abused. Child Affairs Desk at the police station. Now, this is important. That should have happened, at least within the last one and a half years. On the way to, the, to Bangkok a couple of days ago, I was at the airport and I met the superintendent of police from Gazipur who came up to introduce himself. And I asked him, have you got a child affairs police desk in your station? And he said, no, what is, what's that? So nobody knows about it yet. Maybe one day they'll find out. Child affairs police officer, well, if they don't have a desk, they don't need an officer. The idea is to have a senior, in the sense, not a constable, but uh, up to the, at least the rank of a sub-inspector of police who will be heading this child affairs police desk. Now, we are supposed to have probation officers Probation officers, we have now the last count, 46. Um, a few years back, we had only 23. Is there a big improvement? The answer is no, because the law says we must have at least one in every district. Uh, we don't have that. Japan has 50,000. 50, um, the population is minuscule compared to ours. So we need more, obviously. Establishment of children's courts. Well, by law, we have children's courts. They came into being, I think, uh, last, not this April, previous April. The first additional district judge is now in charge of the children's court. And that has defeated the purpose, effectively, because that is probably one of the busiest courts, and they don't have much time for children, as do many of the other institutions and authorities in this country. The new law brings in the concept of diversion. We'll talk about it a little bit more detail later, but diversion essentially, I mean, as you can imagine, what is diversion? Diversion is taking you from a 
path which is either barred or not good, round through a bend or through another road so that you can get back to your path safely and in a, in a better condition. So that's the road diversion I'm talking about. Here diversion means taking you to the end goal without having to go through the criminal justice system. So that's diversion. Family conference is part of diversion. Family conference is where the probation officer will um, gather the people involved, obviously the uh, offending child, um, also the victim, whoever he or she may be, the ch child's family, if necessary teachers and other people who will gather to discuss what is the best solution for this child who has fallen by the wayside. He has offended, he has um, committed a crime, what should we do about him? And who best to decide at the initial stage than the parents who are concerned with the well-being of the child and the other persons who will be also concerned with the well-being, the better, the best um, interests of the child. Alternative dispute resolution, I'm sure you're all aware of. Yes? You should be. Good. So that's also part and parcel of diversion uh, and the system of dealing with children other than in the criminal justice system. Establishment of child development centers and certified institutes. This is something that we don't want or need, but we have to have in certain cases. These are essentially detention centers where the children will be kept so that they don't have to go to the prisons. Now, we don't have many of those. So far, we have only two and a half. Two for boys and one for girls, which is only half full. That's why I say two and a half. The other, there are six other for girls, safe homes, which are called, uh, in the six divisional headquarters. The problem that's created as a result of not having any more of these centers is very simple. We have a fairly big country, not so well linked by communication network. So you can imagine a child who is uh, from Cox's Bazar, Technaf, or wherever, or Lal Monihat for that matter. They will have to go to the center in Joshor. At the best of times, it's difficult. Now think about the people that you're going to be dealing with, the children. Almost invariably, they'll be from the poor background, the poor, the less economically off families. They can't afford, very simply, they cannot afford to go to Joshua from Technaf. It takes too long, it costs too much money. So the other reason, the other problem that's created as a result of this is the tension in the minds of the children. Now you can imagine, a child, whenever he's caught in a, in a criminal activity, suddenly gets frightened. I think I would get frightened if I was suddenly tapped on the shoulder by a policeman and say, sir, you have to go to the police station. Now think of it when you're talking about a child. They do all naughty things at home. They do naughty things at school. But when they get caught stealing, that's not good. Psychologically, they are broken. And at that time, they need their parents, most of all. They need friends around them. And well, who do they have in these centers? Nobody. So one thing that we have tried to do, and uh, I have not yet succeeded, we are trying to link these centers with the outreach, outlying districts, so that the children at least can see and talk to their parents over video link they will get some sort of uh, calming from their pa parents and hopefully they will not do what they did two or three months ago. They self-harmed, they broke glasses, cut themselves up in order to protest what was happening to them. So we need these, more of these development centers. How many do we need? In one of our cases, in one of our judgments, we said that we need at least one in every district so that the children at that time will be accessible to their parents. But um, the Honorable President of this country told me it's not possible because we can't afford it. But he did assure me that we will get at least one in every 
divisional headquarter not too distant future. Alternative care. This is something I think which is very important. Now, as I said, you don't have children perhaps possibly of your own, but you know what children are like. They are vulnerable, they need protection, they need help particularly when they are caught. But what do we have by way of care for them in the institutions? Something which is not good. We do not have any parental care for sure. And in fact, the care that we give them does not put them in a good stead for their future. So we thought it would be a good idea to have kinship care introduced. Kinship care is where either you give the children back to their parents, if they're not suitable, if the parents are not suitable for any reason, you give them to a relative, nearest relative. If you cannot find a nearest relative, you give him to a distant relative. This is called kinship care. If you cannot find even a distant relative, then you find foster parents. Parents, persons who will keep the children within a family surrounding. Because a child, as these goats, they grow up better in a surrounding which is familiar, in a surrounding in which they are loved and cherished and looked after and guided. Now that is what is lacking from the children that we find in our courts. The guidance that our children, your children will get, or the children, people who have children already, their children have got. The guidance to do good things, not to do bad things, to refrain from doing things which will harm others. Now, let, let us go back to basics for a moment. Children who steal are bad, of course they are. But do we s stop to consider why they steal? Are children born thieves? When children are born, they're very cute. We all like to play with them. They are very innocent. And we overlook the things they do wrong. You know, a child looks at a table which has a glass on, on it with water, the child will invariably go and reach for it. Not that he wants to drink the water or hear the sound of glass breaking when he drops it on the floor, but curiosity, just to see what, it, what happens. Now, when the child breaks the glass, you quickly run, grab him, move him away, protect him, save him from cutting himself, and tell him, no, this is not something that's good. Don't do it next time. If you want a glass of water, ask me and I'll give it to you. We do that instinctively. What about the child in the street? Child in the street steals food. Why? Why do you steal food? Because he's hungry. Why does a child in the street steal a mobile phone? Not that he wants to talk to his friend with a mobile phone, because his friend doesn't have a mobile phone. He steals the mobile phone so that he can sell it for whatever amount that he can get, so that he can buy something that he desperately needs and wants. So why do children act criminally? Why do children steal? Because the parents have not been able to provide for them. Why do the parents not provide for them? Because the state has not given them the opportunity to earn the money to provide sufficiently for their children. Because we don't have sufficient jobs. So who is to blame for that child stealing? Tell me. Is the child, first of all, tell me, is the child to blame? No. Parents, first of all. Then, relatives, because they could provide, they don't. They only have their own children in mind. And then, the state, because the state is not providing the, the real um, outlet for income, um, generation for gaining income for the parents. 
But sadly, when you go to the courts, you'll find that our judges are loath to even think about those things. First thing they want to do is put them behind bars. Does putting children behind bars do them any good? The answer is no. Because, first of all, you are taking them away from their familiar surroundings. You are putting them in a more vulnerable position that they, than they were before. And secondly, you are putting them in the best university for criminals. Because the people who are the real criminals remain in the jails and the detention centers because they can't get out. They're not allowed to get out. They have done something very serious. And those petty criminals, they go in there and they become pawns, literally, to the others. The same thing happens in jails. The big shots, the murderers, the big dacoits, they stay there. We don't let them out. But then they teach the others what to do and what not to do, where to go and who to see. They are the ones who are doing all the directions for the criminal activities in our society. A child who is caught with a pistol. Now, a pistol costs money. Now, a good pistol costs a few thousands, even up to a hundred thousand maybe. Who provides them? Who is the criminal? We had a case before us of um, three children caught in um, what's the station? Boirob, Boirob Junction, with seven kgs of gaja, hemp. One was a girl aged eight, another was a boy aged nine, and the third was, was another boy aged 13 or so. All three were arrested, taken to the police station. An FIR was lodged, first information report. Children were produced before a magistrate the following day. Who kept them, where they kept well, during the night, I don't know, because it's illegal to keep them in the police custody. And the following day, the magistrate sent them to Maiman Singh, no, Kishorgunj. Kishorgunj, district jail. The girl in the girl's wing, female wing for safe custody, and the boy, boys in the uh, wing for juvenile delinquents, criminals. And also, the magistrate sent the children to another magistrate to record their statements. The magistrate wrote in the diary that when he asked the question the child, the nine-year-old one, he didn't know what the magistrate was talking about, so he refrained from taking the statement. Now, what does it mean when a magistrate says, I didn't know, I don't know what he was talking about, and therefore I didn't write it down? What does it mean? It means that the child could not commit any criminal offense. He was not aware that what he was doing was criminal. Now, where did the police go wrong? The police went wrong in arresting children. An eight-year-old girl, forget girl, eight-year-old child, can she be arrested? Can she? No, why not? Section 82 of the Penal Code, one of the pillars of our criminal justice system. Section 82 of the Penal Code says, Nothing is an offense done by anyone under the age of nine. So, an eight-year-old child who picks up a knife and stabs someone and kills him or her cannot be arrested because it is not an offense. It is not prosecutable. The law tells us that. Now, if that is the case, could that eight-year-old girl be arrested? The answer is absolutely no. Now, the nine-year-old, well, yes, nine-year-olds can commit criminal offenses and they can be arrested. 
But when the, my magistrate writes down that I couldn't make myself understood, so I didn't take the statement, then you look to section 83 of the Penal Code, which says that anyone between the age of 9 and 12 who could not understand the consequence of his or her act when he or she did it is not liable to criminal prosecution. So, the nine-year-old also could not and should not have been arrested. We asked the magistrate, why did you send them to prison? And he said, wrote back saying it was a Saturday and I couldn't find any probation officer. I didn't know what to do with them, so I thought the best place would be the prison. We actually phoned the deputy commissioner in Kishorgonj. And I said, what do you do with children who come to you in the dead of night or on a Saturday? He said, it's very simple. They, we are only one and a half hours drive from, um, what's that place, Tongi. So we send them there. Tongi is where the children are kept, one of the few uh, development centers that we have, one of the two for boys. And then what happened? An advocate, a learned advocate of the bar, yours and my colleague, moved for bail. Can he move for bail of a nine-year-old child and an eight-year-old child? Can he? Yes? No? I can see shaking heads. Nobody's sure. The answer is absolutely no. Because what is bail? Bail is giving somebody from one custody to another custody. From the custody of the authorities to the custody of the surety. And what is the surety? Surety is to ensure his attendance on the next date. Nothing more, nothing less. But if a child is not liable to prosecution, if he is not liable to custody, is there any question of bail? No. There is no question of bail. Now the cream of the story. The public prosecutor stood up and objected. He opposed the bail. Why? Because it's a serious offense. Of course it is. It's drugs. Drugs is a very serious offense. So what does it show? It shows that our police, our lawyers, our magistrates, and the public prosecutor are not aware of the law. They don't know what the law is. Now, with regards to custody, well, obviously, if I was the magistrate, I would have said to the policeman who brought him before me, right now, take these children to their parents and come back, and I'll tell you why you should not have arrested them. Now, in another case, we suddenly heard from the newspaper, or saw in the newspaper, eight-year-old behind bars. Now, this was an eight-year-old girl who had been arrested and sent to jail. Now, we immediately thought, how can an eight-year-old be behind bars? The law doesn't allow it. As it happened, the girl was nine years and two months old. Oh, well. She can be arrested. Very short story. Am I taking too long? Short story. This girl is told by her father, go and see uncle so-and-so, and he'll tell you to do something, do it. If he gives you some money, bring it home, and that's it. So she goes to see uncle so-and-so. He ties 28 or 29, I can't remember now, so long ago, and my memory is failing as well, his age. They start with her 28 bottles of Fencidil tied around her body. Of course, they get caught by the police. It's called caught red-handed. Fencidil, very serious. Drugs. With 28 bottles of Fencidil, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you can be hanged. Yes? See, Justice Jubair tells me you can be hanged for 28 bottles of Fencidil. Now, this nine-year-old girl we asked the judge to consider, does she appreciate what this little bottle containing this, is it purple color or some sort of purplish color, 
fluid. I don't know. Would this girl know what it is? Would this girl know the effect of it? That it is illegal to carry it? Why is it illegal to carry it? Or is she doing it simply through deference to her parents' dictate? The answer probably is the second. No food. What is she doing? If she didn't do what she was told to do, maybe she would have been deprived from a meal that evening. Okay. So I think the judge understood. He got the picture. Where do you send her? To her father? No. Because her father has proved by his action that he is not capable of being her parent, or at least of looking after her, particularly at that moment in time, because he has instigated her to do a criminal act. We don't want her to go back to him to be told to do something more. So the mother, the mother happens to be in jail, because she is also a carrier of drugs. We luckily found the grandfather. But the grandfather is an old man, barely able to look after his own finances. And within a few weeks, we also found an uncle who was pretty well to do. So the uncle was told to provide the finances, and the grandfather told to keep her in his custody. That's solution for one case. What about the rest? Do we have a system in place? The answer is no. We don't have a system in place. And that's where we go back to our alternative care. We have the new system of institutional care for disadvantaged children. Well, it's not new. We've, already, we've always had them. But is it good? The answer is some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. We have in the law victim, victim witness protection. Now, that is in a, to a very small scale. If you look at the law, I would urge you to, if any of you are interested in dealing with children, then of course I would urge you to look at the law. It's all in Bangla. And if you're not so good at Bangla like me, then there might be an unofficial translation for it. Um, what it really boils down to is that the children in court will have the facility or the benefit of not having to confront the uh, perpetrator um, they will be able to give evidence from behind the screen or even if necessary and possible they will be able to give evidence through video linking. Now the next one is most important, legal representation. The new law is such that no case against a child can proceed, it cannot move without there being a legal representative. The law itself provides that if for any reason the legal representative is not available or is not capable or is not willing, then the trial, trial, the proceedings must be stopped until another one is engaged. I believe that's a, a very good thing to do because these children do need help. Then we have also penalties for offenses in respect of children. Um, I'll talk about that a little later. Children's courts have been established since April, I told you, 15th of April 2014. All cases now where the child is an offender will be dealt with by the children's court. I presume that means that even those cases which would otherwise go to the tribunals will now come to the children's courts. But then there is a saving clause, which I believe says that those which are already in the system will carry on, will continue. But then there is a little bit of a gray area as to the operation of the exclusion clause. The, sorry, the savings clause. The trial of children where they are alleged to have committed a crime along with adults, again, those cases will be tried in the children's court, nowhere else. But they will be tried separately 
at separate times. They ought to be tried in separate buildings, in separate rooms, but we don't have the uh, benefit of having separate buildings for children's courts. So if, for example, the trial is taking place of an adult and a child together, then the child will be, his trial will take place in the morning. The same witnesses will give their evidence again in the afternoon for the adult trial. The court arrangement, decorations and seating plans, all explained now in the new law and probably will be more and more explicitly explained in the new rules which are yet to come. One very worrying factor is that the law says that the court staff and police and other officials will not wear their official garb. So the policemen will not be in uniform, the court staff will not be in any uniform, but it doesn't say anything about the judges not wearing their gowns. Now I heard later that the judges feel a little um, small when they don't wear their gowns. They want to be known as who they are. It's a great shame because the essential purpose of the children's trial is to make it into a, an atmosphere which is familiar, which is comfortable for them. We don't want the children to be facing a criminal trial. We don't want them to know exactly what it's like to become a criminal. We want to try to steer them away from the crimes. But that's our judges. They feel insecure without their gowns. Punishments which may be awarded is there. One thing which is important with children's law, and that was the same in the previous act, and that is that you're all aware that in criminal cases, once a judgment is written and signed, that's it. The judge cannot touch it anymore. He is functus officio. There's no review in criminal justice. The only, thing, only way up is either revision or appeal before the higher authorities. But in a children's case, the court does not finish by signing the judgment. And more so in the new law, which specifically says that the judge will pass the order and state in his judgment that this is not final effectively, and that he will again look at the case, maybe in some weeks or some months or whenever the probation officer brings it to his notice, or whenever the allotted time period is up on probation, for example, it'll come back to him to deal with in a way that is more beneficial to the child. So if, for example, a child is sent to detention for three years and the detaining authorities say, he's good now, he's behaving well. I had one, one case where a child who had done a serious act, actually, was in the detention center in Joshua. And they were writing reports, of course they have to, by law. And they were writing that he has become so good, he has become a mentor, a good mentor for all the other children. And he leads five times prayers in the detention center. And uh, lo and behold, these reports actually helped him to get released after two years. Which was, I think, a great thing, but now the law specifically allows for those provisions. So there is the provision for review. Participation of the child. Now that is something which if you, any of you know the CRC, that's there in Article 12 of the CRC. The child must know, must be able to say to the best of his ability what is he thinks, what he thinks is best for him. Because just think about it, you, the judges, or the lawyers, or the probation officer, are deciding everything for the child. Think about a family case, a divorce case, where a child is involved. Now the father and mother will be fighting tooth and nail for everything, including property and the property of the child, person of the child too. I mean, you can just imagine father pulling at one arm and mother pulling at the other and 
who cares if the child breaks down in the middle? Do they care? I don't think so. Now, the interest of the child is paramount. We know that since, what, 1893? The Guardians of Wards Act? Come on, who's, who's the good lawyer before us? Guardians and Wards, Wards Act, 1890. Let's say 1890. It's fairly close to that anyway. So welfare of the child has been paramount since that time. So it's nothing new, but the CRC says, in a different way, the best interest of the child. Our new law also now speaks of the best interest of the child. So when the father and mother are fighting tooth and nail as to who will get the custody of the child, ripping the arms and legs of the child, there has to be somebody to represent the child. You would think that there would be a provision for engaging a lawyer. The answer is, well, this law doesn't have anything to do with civil trials. Unfortunately, that is one of the things lacking in this law. But nevertheless, I've talked to judges who have told me that they do actually talk to the children to find out what the child feels about custody, who they like. When we had one case in the High Court where a child, a four-year-old boy, was brought before the court. The mother brought this case, I think, if I'm not mistaken, under 102, habeas corpus. And the father was, of course, wanting custody. And the honorable judge asked me what he should do. And I feel stupid now. I said, well, for a four-year-old child, obviously the mother is a better person to keep the child's custody without looking into the facts at all. He went back into court and ordered for the child to be taken to the mother. And the child was screaming in court. I do not want to go to my mother. I want to stay with my father. The reason was very simple. The mother had been away while the father was looking after the child. And obviously, the child had become accustomed and attached to the father. We should have asked the child, not whose custody you want to go to, because he doesn't know what the word custody means. Who likes you better? Who do you like more, your father or your mother? And why? What's happened? We as judges and you as lawyers must always take the opportunity to find out what is best for the child and why. We also must ensure that every child has parents, meaning both mother and father, because both are equally important for proper development of the child. Of course, there may be circumstances when one of them becomes unsuitable that's to, t to be taken into consideration when dealing with the final decision. But the child must be asked. It doesn't necessarily have to be followed, but at least that will give us an idea of the situation in which the child has been brought up, has grown up. Now, back to criminals. Now, I talk, once talked to a, a magistrate. I invited him round to my house for a cup of tea and uh, wanted to find out exactly how he deals with children in a particular set of circumstances. And the way he was talking was fine. You know, he un understood all the children's laws and he was very happy to tell me all about it. And I was very happy to hear that he actually knows the law. But when he reached the door when I was throwing him out, he said, but you know, sir, our children are these days so devious and so cunning in their criminal activity, they have to be locked up. <laughs> now, on a subsequent occasion, when this magistrate was there along with others, judges and magistrates, I said, you know what? You people think everybody that comes before you is a criminal. Of course they are. Because you don't see any good people. From morning till evening, seven days a week, all you see are criminals. You don't know what good people look like. 
And that's why you want to lock them all up. But just think of a situation when your sister comes running to you. My son has been taken away by the police. He's a good boy. He didn't do anything wrong. It's just that the other boys were with him. They did the wrong thing and he was caught along with them. Now what will you, Mr. Magistrate or Judge, what will you do? You will run to the biggest officer that you know, the most powerful, and he will say, Sir, my nephew is the best, but he was just caught in bad company. Sir, let him off the hook this time. He'll never happen again. I can guarantee it. Wouldn't you do that? Now, you people, would you not do something like that for your kith and kin? Yes? That's natural. Of course you will. Now, who will do that for a child in the street? Or for the child of a poor rickshaw puller who just got caught up in some mess? We don't have the mentality to deal with our children properly. Oh, we're going back to history. Section 82 and 83 I've told you all about. Family conferences, I've told you very briefly. I don't think I need to go into any detail because obviously if any of you are interested in these things, then you can look it up. Safe custody, also I've dealt with that. For the last resort and for the shortest period of time. I think I've already explained to you the reasons. Because detention, imprisonment, custody in a foreign surroundings is not good for children. They have to be kept separate from children who, are, who have been found guilty, obviously. Because the child who has been found guilty of have com having committed an offense is, under, by any other definition, a criminal. And he is used to doing wrong things. A child who has not yet been tried, he is innocent by law. And if you mingle the two together, it's almost invariably the fact that he will, the bad one will catch up and teach everything he knows to the good one. The time frame for concluding the trial, that's all in the law. But then again, I think the gist of the law to expedite the hearings has so far been lost basically because we don't have enough courts and unfortunately I have to say that we have chosen the wrong court to do this particular trial. But then I believe that in the not too distant future there will be a change where I hope if the law minister is true to his words there will be a separate and distinct court which will deal exclusively with children's cases um, all the time until he finishes his own cases, then he will go to other cases. Court which will deal exclusively with children's cases um, all the time until he finishes his own cases, then he will go to other cases. Establishment of child development centers, the law now provides that the government will provide centers in every district. If the government is not capable of doing that for economic reasons, then obviously they can and will obvious, uh, certainly turn to private organizations. I told you that I would say a little bit more about victim witness protection. Uh, the law now specifies how it shall be done. But the question I pose at the end is the important one. Is the system ready? The answer to that is no. We've had one and a half years of the law and very little has been done. And we go back to the attitude problem. Children are having difficult times because of the attitude of the adults. We treat the offending children as scum of society. They are bad. They need to be dealt with properly. Chile lobon lagayadao. That's the idea. One very senior judge, I won't go any further than saying that because then you'll know who I'm talking about, actually said, that when these children come to court, they must realize that they have done a criminal activity, they must realize what they've done wrong, and they must realize how they will be treated. Because if you deal with a criminal child, I'm calling him criminal at this stage because that's what our, how our judges think about them. But if you deal with them in that way, with that attitude, 
then you will have so many petty thieves becoming dacoits and murderers. And who are they going to commit the crimes upon? Whose houses are they going to burgle? Who are they going to hijack in the streets? Well, tell me, you and me. They're not going to kill a rickshaw puller for, for his money. What are we doing? We are creating a society full of criminals for our own pains. We don't think about the disaster that we are bringing upon ourselves. The biggest problem here is that the class of people who are judges and lawyers to a certain extent have come from surroundings which are totally unfamiliar to us, to those unfamiliar or, or unnatural to the ones where the criminal children come from. We don't stop to think and realize what those children have suffered to get to that place where they are now. And we don't stop to think what will happen if we let them loose, if we create more of them. Your children and my children will not stay here. Well, one of them has just come back, but she won't stay here. They'll all go away. So who's going to be here? The rickshaw puller's son, the, the pan cigarette seller's son. They're going to be ones who, who's going to stay here. They will form the society. And if you don't treat them properly, they will not treat you nicely. Look at it another way. You treat one child who is a pretty criminal now, bring, them, bring him to the right path, and you have saved yourself from a dacoit. And children can be mended. It's a fact. Goats can be trained. You've seen that. Little kids. They will learn good things if you can teach them the good things. Those kids from the shanties, they do bad things because they haven't been told and guided in the proper way. They haven't been told and guided about good things. So we have the system of diversion where hopefully the police will now say to the children, OK, you've done this. It's wrong. You are warned. Don't do it again. Next time. That's all it needs. For a good child, good meaning mentally good, who had some sense, he will not do it again. And statistics tells us that if you protect, treat 10 children, seven of them will come to the right path. Three will never be cured. Fact of life. Can't cure everything and everybody. But in this process, you have saved yourself from seven hardened criminals. Look at, look at it in another way. That child who has been diverted from the police station is free. Gone back to his family. Gone back to the community. Hopefully, with the lesson that he should not do bad things again. You know, the sort of practice where you get to give your clients invoices. This is not what you usually do. That is all the more reason why you should be grateful for this particular lecture. Because it has drawn your attention to an area of the law where you usually do not practice. But because of the social aspect that my Lord Mr. Justice Iman Ali has uh, focused upon while presenting the lecture, you are probably in positions where you can do many things in order to help the situation. Of the various information that were presented in the slide, 
the most significant one to me was a factoid which was presented right at the beginning which was the number of children in Bangladesh. The number of children in Bangladesh is 75 million. That constitutes approximately, I may be wrong in so far as the exact figures are concerned, but I think it constitutes approximately half of our population. So the provision of law that has been discussed and the attention or lack of attention of the state in ensuring that its provisions are actually affected is to cater to half of our population. And which half of our population? That half of our population which is most vulnerable, that half of our population which does not get to vote, that half of our population that does not have representation. And yet, when you reflect that for the 64 districts of Bangladesh, there are only 43 probationary officers. You get to understand the lack of commitment in our system in realizing this particular objective of the legislation. I'm also very grateful to Mr. Justice Iman Ali for informing us anecdotally of individual instances which I'm sure he has drawn upon from his own experience in the bench in illustrating for you the practical consequences of uh, the legislation and the difficulties that the system has encountered in implementing this uh, legislation. I would also take this opportunity to give you some more points upon which you can ponder. There are two judges of the Supreme Court in Bangladesh before me, one of the appellate division, Mr. Justice Iman Ali himself, and my Lord, Mr. Justice Sayyid Rafat Ahmed of the High Court Division. The Supreme Court, in its role of superintendence over the subordinate judiciary, can also play a role over here in ensuring that the members of the subordinate judiciary who have to deal with these cases on a day-to-day -day basis are adequately sensitized to the particular issues that are involved. In Bangladesh, we do not have specialist judges dealing with family cases. The judges, for instance, the, the implementing court for this particular legislation is the first additional sessions judge of every district. Uh, my Lord, Mr. Justice Iman Ali has indicated of his caseload. But apart from his caseload, there is also the issue of whether he has sufficient specialist training into, in dealing with the particular issues that are involved when we come to dealing with children. So this is also something which may be considered looked upon, whether it is time insofar as our judicial uh, service cadre is concerned, whether there is scope for specialization of individual judges so that they are given longer times in dealing with particular jurisdictions so that they are able to better uh, understand the issues that are involved so that they are not deprived, so that the system is not deprived of their wisdom which is accumulated over a period of three years posting in one court only for him to be transferred somewhere else where he does not deal with this sort of cases. He personally is perhaps benefited from the variety of his experience, but the system is perhaps sometimes deprived of his accumulated wisdom. So in developing career structures, in informing policies which pertain to their promotion and to their transfer, these things may also be <coughs> taken into account. I will not prolong this, uh, my commentary on this uh, lecture save and accept to say that when the, the thing that has come through in Mr. Justice Iman Ali's lecture for me is this. I'm not sure whether I'm able to articulate properly. When we protect our children, in effect, for a myriad of reasons, we are actually protecting ourselves. That's the most important lesson that I take away from this lecture. When we protect our children, we actually protect ourselves. We protect our future in various ways. We protect our children, uh, protect our future as far as the children themselves are concerned. We protect ourselves in ensuring that the child who has offended the law does not grow up to be a criminal. When we protect the children, we ensure that in future the state is relieved of various burdens, the expense, the human resources that are 
eaten up when we have to process a criminal through the system. We've spared ourselves of that particular expense. And provided the provisions of the Children's Act can be realized, then in time, the opportunity cost of taking that measure will bear a fruit for us. Perhaps we won't be able to quantify it because in the sense that uh, we won't be able to statistically prove that uh, 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 the benefit of uh, having implemented these laws have ensured that such and such individuals have not become criminals. But over a period of time, I'm sure society will be able to get the benefit of it. I will conclude my brief remarks by thanking uh, again the Think Legal team, in particular Saqib and Anita. The objective of this exercise of Think Legal's project is to ensure that, uh, is to create a forum where issues of topical interest in legal practice in our legal system are discussed, are introduced to the younger generation so that they can effectively make their own contributions in these areas. And to that extent, I must say that they have made a very good beginning. This is the second lecture. The first lecture was given by my Lord Mr. Justice Sayyid Rifat Ahmed, where he drew attention to another aspect of our legal system, which is very important, the independence of the judiciary. Today, you have had an opportunity to know about a particular law which I'm afraid most of you probably do not have occasion to deal with insofar as your practice is concerned, but one which affects half of our population and that half of our population which is its most vulnerable. I'm sure in the days to come we will have other leading personalities of our judicial system as well as our academia informing us, enthralling us, regaling us, and most importantly showing us the way for our future insofar as other areas of law are concerned. So with that, I would like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Since we have a very, uh, uh, we, we rarely get an opportunity, and uh, certainly this is another thing why the younger persons over here should be very grateful. It's not every day that you get to meet and discuss legal issues with Supreme Court judges. So now you have an opportunity. If there are any questions that you want to, would want to ask him, not only from this particular area of practice, may I say, but also other areas of interest. So without further ado, would anybody like to begin? Would you like to begin? The other one, the third one, which is just for girls, is in Kunabari in Gajipur. They have also control over all the other uh, institutes relating to uh, care and protection of children, where the children are kept orphans and everything, everybody else. So it is the social welfare ministry who will deal with all of this and anything to do with custody and detention. Uh, it is they who will um, give the certification to the either the existing um, institutions which will be converted to child development centers or any new development centers which are set up under the new law. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank you for making it a very interesting as well as informative uh, speech. As you have uh, pointed out, uh, your views are rather pro-children and uh, one may say it's, it's uh, not at par with the traditional view, as you have rightly said, some of your other judges think that children should be treated in a different way. Wouldn't you say that this is more of a cultural issue uh, in this context and how much can laws actually help in this regard where we think of children as capable of committing crimes and they should be punished and they should be beaten up. So don't you think there's a cultural battle involved in this more so than the legal one? The, the, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. As I said at the very beginning, if you remember, the, this situation that we are now faced with existed in America, United States of America, UK and other now developed countries. So even there they had children who were working. Even there they sold children, they bought children, they used children, abused children. They have now grown out of it, but not entirely. Even now we have in America children being used in the 
farms who should not legally be in uh, sort of working situations. We have children all over the world, including other developed countries, where the children are being treated like criminals. Children in uh, India, they, they are recently passing a law in 2015 saying that um, children between the age of 16 and 18 who commit heinous offences will be dealt with in the adult courts and dished out the adult punishments. Now that is going back on the law which they passed in 2000 and uh, they went in 2006 which said that they will deal with all their children in such a way that they get the benefit of the law. And ironically, the very minister who introduced the law in 2000 and said so many good things about the law because they were dealing with their children in a good way is now changing the law and dealing with children in an adult way. Now, the way I look at it is that whatever a child, and I mean anyone under the age of 18 because that is the internationally accept, accepted age, whatever a child has done may be very serious. You cannot suddenly upgrade the definition of child or downgrade the definition of an adult in order to encompass this 16 to 18 year old. You're absolutely right that you know, it's our mindset, but then mindsets change. They are changing. They have changed and they will change. Take for example the instances of child marriage. Now you will be shocked to hear, because most of you have not dealt with this topic, that we stand, I think, sixth in the league <coughs> as, the, as the country with the most child marriages. 66% child marriage in our country. And that's happening for various reasons. And we're not the only country. I mean, there are six others, five others above us, and there are so many others below us. But it's happening because of mindset, attitudes. But that is changing. I'll just give you one small example. I went to my village home just a year or so ago, two years ago, where I specifically asked the school um, authority to bring before me um, a number of girls, uh, teenage girls between the age of 14 and 16 who were attending my school. I wanted to ask them what they thought about child marriage. Believe it or not, I think I met about eight or ten, I can't remember exactly, I've looked somewhere. They, all of them, said that they will not allow themselves to be married off before the age of 18. And some of them even said, I will not get married until I qualify as a graduate. So, 21. One particular girl I remember very vividly, she was staying with her brother because um, she doesn't have parents. She was living with her brother. And um, I feel sorry that I treated her in this way now. But I asked her, what will you do if your brother says that, look, I can't cope with you anymore. Best thing for me to do is to get you married off, off of my shoulders. You don't have any parents, where will you go? And she started crying. And she cried and said, I will not let it happen. So attitudes change, and it is these children who will change our attitudes. We have a bright future, if only we can deal with our children in the proper way. Uh, my question for you is, uh, it's a bit uh, on a practical sense, I would like, which I have personally encountered recently, is that we often get case papers where uh, the age of the accused is uh, like, uh, we, we come to know from the uh, parents of the accused or from, the, from his birth certificate that the actual age of the accused is 13 years or 14 years. However, after the police report is submitted, the charge sheet is submitted, the age suddenly changes, like it comes to 18 or 19 years. Right, so I'm, my question for you is, is there any regulations like in the PRB or in the CRPC that which would guide the police 
uh, to treat the children in a more proper way and uh, and how to do in fact to come out of this problem basically uh, yeah, i'm Baisa sanjit siddiqui i'm i'm recently enrolled to practice in the high court division okay. and yep. uh, i'm an associate of Baisa A. M. Mahabuddin yep. Thank you. the situation was a little bit more difficult before now <coughs> one case i had in my court where a child no older than my own son was brought before me accused in a case of a Nari Shishu Nijat um, He was accessory, obviously. And he had been given the age of 18. Before then, at the time, the law was 16 for a child. And the reason behind that was very simple. Because in a Nari Shishu case, they don't get bail. If he was a child, then he would automatically almost get bail. So, it's the informant who actually gave the age higher than he actually was, so that he would not get the bail. So we had difficulties. The law even then was such that it was up to the court to decide to have a separate hearing to assess the age of the child, collecting all the possible documentary and oral and other evidence in order to establish what the child, what the person's age was and to see that he is not a child, and if he was found to be a child, then to deal with him as a child. But things have become easier now because the new law gives the police the authority to check the age. So in spite of the fact that somebody may say in the FIR that he is 18 or 19 or whatever he may say, the police is still duty bound to check for records. So they will check the school records, they will check the birth records, they will check any other official records to establish the age and although birth registration has been compulsory for many years it is not universal it hasn't happened throughout the country but hopefully in the not too distant future we will have a situation where all births will be registered and even now we have the online registration scheme the police can um, <coughs> literally push a few buttons to find out the age if they want so in the future, I think we will not have too much difficulty with age. So you highlighted that there seems to be a gap in the knowledge in terms of what the actual law is. Um, so I want to know what part of the training curriculum for police, prosecutors and judges is um, allocated for specialist laws like the Children Act? Uh, the police are obviously out of the scheme at the moment. Before there used to be a course run by the Legal Education Training Institute, LETI, it's attached to the Bar Council, where I used to lecture to police, probation officers, NGO workers, and lawyers. And I also used to lecture and train the judges at the JATI. Now the JATI program is continuing, and we have developed a scheme whereby, with the help of BLAST, even the senior judges, before it used to be just the newly appointed judges who were trained, but now even the senior judges will be trained uh, in children's law. So far as the police is concerned, I don't know what scheme they have at the moment. I believe possibly they don't, from what I have heard from the police officer that I met at the airport. Uh, <laughs> nobody even knows about the law yet. Uh, time will come, I think, when they will be brought into the scheme. Um, I believe that UNICEF is taking some steps to organize some training along with the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs. Uh, so hopefully there will be training schemes in place in the not too distant future. And that will cover police as well as other actors who are dealing with children. That person didn't introduce herself. Yes, yes, I was about to um, make that <laughs> I'll tell you, she has written a small book on um, the children's rights in Bangladesh. Uh, that really has a small commentary by her, and the important thing is that it uh, sort of gives sort of small excerpts which will help any of you dealing with children's cases. And also, more beneficially, it, will, it has a, an appendix section which contains 12 judgments that I have delivered on justice for children, rights for children, uh, in the last so many years. Um, which I believe the practitioners will find useful.
Thank you. Najrana Iman is her name. <laughs> he is supposed to be here answering questions. <laughs> I work in the area of judicial governance and access to justice. And uh, recently I've had a, an opportunity to look into the Legal Aid Act and the Legal Aid Rules. Um, the Village Court Act, which did not, you know, the Village Courts did not take take off in a big way, but then there, there's been a revisitation to revamp the system. And the focus has always been on the marginalized and the disenfranchised getting easier access to the formal or the informal justice delivery system. And then we always go back to 28-4, as, uh, and, and the constituents are always women and children, which is fine, and we're making great strides in that regard. But the question always remains that 44 years into independence, I always see Article 28.4, which is something akin to a notion of affirmative action as a terrible indictment of our failures to ensure equality for all sections of the society. And I think what Justice Imanali has stressed upon at the end of the day today is that we move ahead uh, with all positive uh, acts and in good intentions with legislation as, 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 as the Child Act, with the view, in conjunction with other legislation that we have to protect women and children, with the view at the end of the day, maybe 10 years from now, that we can write off Article 28.4 from our Constitution. That is one amendment that I will in, um, welcome. I've not been very charitable towards several other amendments that have been introduced to the Constitution, but that's for another day. But this is one amendment that I want to look forward to in my life. So Article 28.4 will become superfluous. I hope so. And thank you, Justice Imanuel. You wonderful, engaging, and uh, uh, what should I say? Um, very, very uh, forthright with your comments, and I hope that you know all your efforts. Much of what you heard today, and much of what you see in the form of legislation, is owed to this this great man. Thank you. It's gravity by adding anything. So, with that, let us conclude today's proceedings. Thank you very much.